Ξεκινάμε, έστω και με μια μικρή κατηθέρηση, ένα πολύ ενδιαφέρον session. Είπαμε ότι το μεσημέρι σας είπα ότι έχουμε μια μικρή αλλαγή, γιατί ο καθηγητής πίστας πρέπει να φύγει, θα τον περιμένει ταξί κατευθείαν να πάει στην Αθήνα για να πετάξει. Οπότε από... κάνουμε μια μικρή αλλαγή, το περιστατικό του κυρίου Κουσουρνά θα πάει αύριο, ο εικονικός, μετά τα Gold, για να μπορέσουμε λίγο να βολέψουμε, να τον εξυπηρετήσουμε. Άλλωστε είναι μια μεγάλη χαρά και τιμή, γιατί ένας άνθρωπος που έχει προσφέρει σε όλο τον κόσμο, δηλαδή είναι το μισό του χρόνο στην Αμερική, στη θέση του ως καθηγητής, και το μισό χρόνο ταξιδεύει χειρουργώντας και προσφέροντας στους ασθενείς πραγματικά μια τεράστια ανθρώπινη και ιατρική προσφορά, μέσα σε αυτά είμαστε, είχαμε τη μεγάλη τύχη λόγω της σχέσης που έχει αναπτύξει με τους συναδέλφους της Λάρισα και τον Βασίλη τον Τζόρτζη, να έχουμε και το μοναδικό κέντρο στην Ελλάδα που μπορεί να αντιμετωπίζει τον α, μεταστατικό λεμφαδενικό ε, τους λεμφαδενικούς όγκους ε, στους καρκίνους του Όρχη. Και ο Βασίλης ο Τζόρτζης μπόρεσε πραγματικά και έστησε αυτό και το προχωράει τα περισσότερα περισσότερα πλέον γίνονται, τα κάνει μόνος του. Κάποια ίσως ακόμα έρχεται ο πίστης, αλλά πλέον σπάνια. Κάνει το 1-20% των περιστατικών ε, και στηρίζει ακόμα αυτή την προσπάθεια και αυτό που ουσιαστικά είναι δημιούργημα των δύο ανθρώπων. Και γι' αυτό θεώρησα ότι καλύτερα απ' όλα είναι να, έχουμε, να τους έχουμε μαζί μια φορά για να πούμε κι εμείς σαν μια μικρή κοινότητα που είναι το σχολείο με τους μαθητές του ένα ευχαριστώ και να έχουμε τη χαρά να τον ακούσουμε λίγο σε ένα ελεύθερο θέμα. Του είπα ό,τι νομίζεις μπορείς να πεις. So, επιτρέψα μου λίγο να πω δύο λόγια, Βασίλη, λίγο και στα αγγλικά και μετά να παραδώσω στο Βασίλη για να τον προσφωνήσει. Uh, so, what I'm saying uh, to the students at this school is that, uh, uh, is that you are an example for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> spending your life traveling and teaching and uh, surgical skills and also all your knowledge and all your experience and uh, uh, for the Greek people, not only the Greek uh, physicians, this is a huge thing because uh, this is the only center that we can send all the patients we have from all over Greece in order to be treated. Uh, before uh, uh, the beginning of this uh, effort, Uh, we had uh, the whole family, you know, because the Greeks they don't go alone to the doctor. The whole family had to move abroad. And uh, of course, it's not only that the government will cover some expenses for the patient, but it's the whole family. So they have even to, to sell uh, their houses <laughs> in order to try to save these people. You know all this, but just I want just uh, sometimes we have to to really express and to describe this, the whole situation in order to understand how important is the contribution of uh, some people. So, just to thank you for, uh, for all these years, that's a lot of years. Thank you because uh, we started, uh, I know Vasilis from the first day of his uh, residency and uh, Uh, it is really a great moment for me and uh, for the school having you here. Just a few words. I know that you are fed up with good words and you are not, it's not your personality that he, you ask for something like that. Uh, and just, uh, it is really nice that I will give now as well to Basilis uh, to introduce you and feel free, as I have already discussed with uh, Basilis, I will put the title and uh, he can say whatever he wants. Okay, and thank you again. No, no, Luis, I will skip introductions. I think so much were for nothing. The only thing that I was to say, I want to say is that I feel very lucky in my life because uh, you are my mentor, I think my friend. So thank you again to coming here and to teach all this kind of knowledge that you have doing surgery all these years. Thank you. Well, um, um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And um, yeah, I, 
what's fun about the Euro School is we can learn from each other. So uh, uh, I love the Latin saying carpe diem or seize the day. Uh, it's important for all of us to uh, seize the day. And um, we'll, what I want to do is sort of give a brief overview of your logic oncology, where it's been and sort of like uh, some of the what's happening in the present. And I was asked to sort of talk about the future, which I will touch on briefly. Um, I have no conflicts of interest other than I love Greece. It's a wonderful country. Um, I started coming here in the midst of the crisis in 2008. And uh, the uh, uh, Greek people uh, have been through a lot. And it's just fun to sort of make any kind of contribution I can to help this country. Uh, but I have nothing, no conflicts of interest. Um, what I'll, I'll kind of go over is that uh, urologic oncology has continued to innovate and progress. Um, in my opinion, big innovations or rapid change occurs kind of in bursts. It's not, it's sort of like a big burst and then it slows down in another big burst. Uh, examples of that would be the development of uh, robotic surgery kind of happened in, uh, you know, it's changed things. Um, also, the development of immunotherapy occurred relatively fast. Uh, for years, immunotherapy went nowhere. And then all of a sudden, it's a major player in the treatment of urologic disease. Uh, I also think that as, as a group, urologists are really good at adopting to new technology. So when new technology comes out, um, as a community, uh, urologists are usually um, relatively early adopters, and then we figure out where a role is, and we're, we're pretty good about um, helping to control things for our practices. Um, I think one thing that we all recognize is that change is inevitable, and change will occur faster. New developments will occur faster, and um, the future, in my opinion, is uh, bright, and it shouldn't, we shouldn't look at it as scary. And um, with that, we'll, we'll start looking at the past. So like a lot of modern, like uh, when you look at urology and you look at medicine um, and you look at the modern world, uh, one important thing to realize is that the language for medicine and, and the cultural basis for medicine and the modern world and democracy, of course, started here in Greece. The, world, the word urology, is in fact Greece, uh, and it's, uh, I can't read Greek, but it's urine in the Greek, and all uh, logia, or the study of. Even the specialty word is uh, a Greek word, uh, but many terms come from uh, Greek mythology and Greek language. I just give a couple of examples, like hermaphrodism from Hermes and Aphrodite. Venereal diseases uh, from the Roman name of Aphrodite, Venus. Priapism from Priapus, syphilis from the shepherd uh, Cephalos. Um, I'd also like to point out how important Hippocrates was. Uh, to Greeks, that may be uh, kind of like obvious, but one of Hippocrates' famous statement, he, he obviously wanted to be a student at the Euro School here. Uh, but he said, I will not cut even for the stone, but I will leave such procedures to the practitioners of the craft. And I think uh, what the point he was trying to get at, uh, Hippocrates, was the idea of not to do harm, don't do any harm to the patient. And if uh, someone else has a better skill set to take care of the patient, by all means, send that person to another uh, physician. Um, I, I think that statement also points to the idea that uh, as practitioners of the craft, uh, urologists, we need to, the importance of Euro school and any kind of educational effort is to get better in our own professions. And no matter at what stage we're at, we can always get better. We can always improve. Um, the other thing that's cool about Hippocrates is that he's a man who was way ahead of his time. He knew the he. Uh, he knew the importance of urine color and sediment. And when we realize sort of modern urinalysis, it's amazing. You can detect urinary tract infection. You can detect casts in the urine that would show evidence of nephritis. Uh, you know, you, if you look at the sediment, you can see even cysteine crystals and 
make a diagnosis of cystinuria. Uh, but um, Hippocrates realized that the urine could reflect what was happening inside the body. And I think as such, he was uh, years, like many of his things were pro prophetic. He was years ahead of his time. So um, I'm gonna point out just a couple uh, people that I think have made major contributions to the field of urology. One is this uh, Italian, Philip Bazzini. Um, he developed uh, the precursor to the cystoscope. So part of it is sort of like to adapt light and then look into an orifice. And if, if you look at the picture, and this is from the EAU history office, uh, you know, the um, big device in the center provided the light and then he added sort of like a speculum. I don't think you could see much with that more than the urethra. But this was the first prototype and then um, by the turn of the century, um, cystoscopes were being produced that um, uh, one of the other developers of the uh, cystoscope is this German, Maximilian Nitze. Uh, but what's kind of fascinating is by the, uh, the, you know, about 1920s, so about 90 years ago, they had a cystoscope that almost looks like the ones that are in our offices. So the cystoscope instrument as it is has been, you know, sort of like, uh, it was developed and they had pretty good working examples of it like even 90 years ago with irrigation, et cetera. But then you, you sort of like look at what's happened today is that uh, we've had 20 years of the robot so far. And we had the O version, the S, the SI, the XI, and now the SP version of robot. So, but the robotic surgery has um, uh, been around for 20 years. Uh, so it's not, uh, you know, the, at the rate of change, I'm sure that there's gonna be many uh, other robotic platforms, um, and those are already being developed, uh, but I'm not gonna dwell on that. Um, if I look at who I think some of the grandfathers or important figures are in urologic oncology, um, they're, at least in my country, in the United States, uh, uh, Doug Johnson was the uh, first urologic oncologist at MD Anderson, the hospital I work in. And Willett Whitmore was the first urologic oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And um, the importance of Doug Johnson is that um, when uh, this was sort of like in the 60s uh, and 70s, when they did cystectomies in that era, the mortality of the surgery was high. And um, what he was good at is developing uniform care so that this, the cystectomy would be done in the same way, same manner by all the practitioners. He was good at, at instituting that. Uh, the other thing is that in that era, they didn't have good stress tests and so on. Like how do you check and see if the patient's fit enough for surgery? Uh, what they would do is take the patient to the, stair, stair, uh, the stairs have them go up two flights of stairs, and if the patient wasn't short of breath, then the patient was fit enough for surgery. And I would argue that I'm not sure, I, I think that would still be a decent test today. Uh, you know, and I, I would love to see a randomized trial of that versus uh, invasive, um, you know, sort of like uh, cardiac testing. It would be kind of fun. But, um, like what I love about all the people who, uh, all the, like every, we can learn from everybody, some two famous statements from Doug Johnson are, if you can't look good, don't look bad. And what Doug meant by that is that if you can't get a good outcome in the patient, then don't operate and get a bad outcome. Um, and another famous Doug, Doug Johnson saying is operating on dying patients is frequently followed by death. He would, he would say that, so kind of like that. that he was a, um, very much an introvert, and, um, but I think he did a lot for the field and he helped, uh, he's sort of like the uh, grandfather, uh, he's passed on now, but the grandfather of our program. 
Then we can look at Willett Whitmore, who was the head of urology at Memorial Sloan Kettering for 30 years. Uh, what's interesting about Will Whitmore is that he was another man uh, before his time. Um, he understood the importance of active surveillance before active surveillance sort of took off. And two of his famous statements are, the current state of prostate cancer may not be good medicine, but it sure is good business. And there are many more people making a living from prostate cancer than are dying from it. I'm maybe not as nihilistic as uh, Will Whitmore. I do think that we uh, cure patients with treatment. I don't, uh, I think we live in a great era just because we have active surveillance and we can do that safely with uh, good outcomes. But I would also point out there are other father, grandfather figures in urologic oncology, I think a lot of credit needs to go to Alan Yagoda, and also Cora Sternberg. I, I don't show a picture of Cora Sternberg, but uh, Alan Yagoda was actually the brains behind MVAC. And um, you know he developed MVAC in 1983, and what's amazing to me is that that chemotherapy, uh, the dose-dense MVAC is uh, still, for chemotherapy for invasive bladder cancer, uh, to use a colloquial term in English, king of the hill means the, the best treatment in terms of chemo. 37 years later, it's better than GEMSIS. If you look at the P0 rate, the chance of having no tumor uh, left after systemic therapy, it's much lower for dose-dense MVAC than for GEMSIS. But it, it's almost like going on, you know, 30, it's been king of the hill for 37 years. The question is, will immunotherapy now um, overtake that? Maybe, we'll see. So I think another uh, two grandfathers, I tried to look online for a uh, picture of uh, Peter Donker. I couldn't find his picture, but both he and Patrick Walsh worked together to describe the cavernous nerves and the four, the, uh, you know, they were the early um, adopters of uh, nerve sparing prostatectomy. And that was about 1982. Uh, so it's, um, by 1984, they were doing nerve sparing retroperitoneal lymph node dissections. But the whole idea here was a shift within urologic oncology to um, preserving function through saving nerves and um, the importance of saving nerves if were feasible to improve functional outcomes. And I, I think that is their contribution major contribution to the field. So I would also um, um, mention people like Andy Novick, and I don't think Andy Novick is sort of like, um, like there, when you look at any of these individuals, it's many people, it's not a certain person. Uh, but Andy Novick helped popularize partial nephrectomy in, um, for renal cell carcinoma. The idea is just that um, Partial nephrectomy had equivalent outcomes and better renal functional outcomes. And this was part of a whole wave within cancer surgery toward uh, less radical resection, uh, for instance, for breast cancer, limb salvage and sarcoma, et cetera. But um, you know, the idea is uh, that um, uh, you, know, you can do partial resection for certain cancers and still get as good an outcome as uh, um, uh, whole organ removal, et cetera, wide resection. Um, one of the things that Andy Novick was famous for is not rounding on patients. He would do the surgery, and um, according to Serena Mateen, who's one of my colleagues, he, uh, he uh, let the fellows in the residence manage rounds uh, mo pr uh, most of the time. So he uh, had quite a unique academic practice. If we look at the present, um, uh, this is a, a picture of Jim Allison. He uh, is a, a scientist in our hospital who uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, for tr his contributions to immunotherapy. So what Jim Allison, and it's not him alone, but it's a group of individuals working with him and others did is, developed the concept that blocking T cell inhibitory pathways could unleash anti-tumoral um, responses. 
And so uh, drugs, this is, has been huge in my opinion, just because for years and years, they thought that immunotherapy would be a major treatment for urologic cancer and for other cancers. And until this, these categories of drugs came out, um, these categories, in my opinion, are a game changer. And I'll, I'll try to describe why I think they're a game changer, big game changer. So um, the, the drugs that inhibit T cell inhibitory pathways have been called immune checkpoint therapies. And the drug that um, Jim Allison helped to get approved was ipilimumab. But um, as all of you know, um, the treatment for renal cell carcinoma has been changed by these drugs, uh, like uh, program cell death one protein checkpoint inhibitors like Nevo and Pembro. Then there's program cell death ligand PDL1 checkpoint inhibitors like uh, Evolumumab and Azotibolab. There's anti cytotoxic T cell associated uh, CTLA4 antibodies, the ipilimumab is an example. And then there's the old vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors. Uh, what's kind of fun is that in the current era, um, the, it used to be that we had nothing for uh, metastatic renal cell carcinoma, interferon, very ineffective, IL-2, tremendously toxic, and now we've got multiple agents. And I would point out that um, the treatment of bladder cancer is changing significantly. Um, also with the uh, um, uh, PD-1 and, and PDL one targeted agents. Um, you know, there's at least um, five of these agents that are approved now for, by the FDA for patients who have had initial systemic chemotherapy for bladder cancer and progressed. And um, the combination of Nevo and Ipi is being evaluated as first-line therapy um, in a phase three trial. The question is whether the immunotherapy will be better than dose-dense MVAC, and um, that's uh, yet to be determined. One thing in the present that um, needs to be emphasized is that with invasive bladder cancer, it's important to evaluate uh, the tumors for fiber, um, fibroblast growth factor receptor two or three, uh, if there's an alteration in that, then um, the FGR inhibitor uh, ertafibinib uh, can have a role. Um, and that, so when patients progress after platinum-based therapy, in our hospital, we check to see if there's evidence of an abnormal fibroblast growth factor receptor. If there is, then the patient's usually uh, treated with uh, Erdofitinib, if they're not, they usually take the immunotherapy. That's kind of what's happening in our hospital. Why do I think these drugs are game changers? Is that I've seen patients uh, with, you would look at the scans, you would look at the bladder and say, maybe six months, uh, totally incurable bladder cancer. And I'm not saying this happens to everybody. The immunotherapy works in 20%, but you get someone who has you would look at them and say, going to be dead in six months, they take the drugs, and then they're cancer-free two, three, four years later, not a sign of cancer anywhere in their body. Now, what's happening now is that some of these patients then develop a new invasive tumor in their bladder, and they're three, four years out, and um, we're starting to do cystectomies on these patients that are otherwise... Uh, you know, because they had metastatic disease, but they're cancer-free a couple years later. And we don't know if that's the right thing or the wrong thing, but um, these kind of things are happening now. And the reason why I think these, these, these drugs don't work in everybody, they absolutely don't. But what happens is that there's a subset of these patients who would otherwise be completely incurable, they take the drug, and some, some of these people, I think, are cured by these drugs alone. It's fascinating. I think the next big hurdle and for the future is, why does it work in 20 and why not in the other 80? But I think that what'll happen is that if we understand how to sensitize the other 80%, um, you know, then I, um, I think maybe these, drug, these type of drugs and other drugs uh, will have uh, a greater role. 
The other thing that I know from our medical oncologists who use these drugs is you can get some really bizarre side effects. Uh, you know, myocarditis, pneumonitis, arthritis, uh, thyroiditis, all kinds of, you have to be, the medical oncologist has to be a, a great classic internist to give these drugs. In our center, we actually have a, um, a specialized center that handles people with many kinds of cancers taking these drugs that get complications. So we have a center within our hospital to take care of immunotherapy complications um, so that we get better at managing the problems. So other developments for the present that I don't know where, that are, if they're going forward or staying static, uh, you know, in 2017, Intuitive came out with the single port robot. And um, you can see in the uh, right hand figure that the instruments come through a single port, the camera, and then the, the other instruments. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, John Davis, is using the SP for prostatectomies. Um, I don't know, uh, I, I'm not in a, I haven't, I, I, I use the XI. Uh, I like the XI robot, it's comfortable. Uh, what John says is if you do a case with this robot, your hands hurt at the end. And I think it may be good in very narrow areas like the back of the throat and stuff like that or for a pyloplasty. I think as, as urologists use this system and you need special training for the system beyond the regular robotic systems, it's different. Um, but um, I haven't gone for that training, but I think this instrument may be good for pyloplasties, reconstructive surgery in a very narrow uh, region. That's where I think this, this technology is headed. So another uh, sort of, um, interesting phenomenon in the present is retiosparing prostatectomy. Uh, this is a, a randomized trial from Italy, and um, they're comparing, um, they have about 50 patients roughly in each group, and they're claiming that the uh, retiosparing surgery has better early continence. Um, my only sort of complaint about this kind of trial, uh, and I, I need to congratulate the authors for doing a randomized trial. Um, there, as time goes on, we'll learn more about retia sparing surgery and what the role is. John Davis in our place is doing this surgery, and the rest of us do it the classic way. Uh, one uh, limitation that I think of this trial is that the continence rates in the traditional prostat robotic prostatectomy, which is shown in red or lower, but there's only about a 75% continence rate. And I think with traditional robotic prostatectomy, it should be around 92, 93. It's probably not that far from the retia sparing. So I'm not sure whether, uh, why the, in this particular randomized trial, why the continence rates in the traditional robotic series is low. But um, whatever, um, we, Randomized trials only tell you so much, especially if there's a small number of patients. So I wanna look at predictions for the future. And um, many future predictions are wrong. Uh, it's always fascinating to go back and look at what people predicted for the future. Uh, but I think that perhaps some safe predictions are to take current trends and extrapolate what the meaning of those trends are. Um, What's kind of fascinating is you look at weathermen, they're wrong most of the time. Uh, they still have a great job. So take every future prediction with uh, much caution. So um, when we look at predicting the future, I think one thing that is fascinating is to look at demographic trends. So this is sort of a map of the world where you can see uh, median age in a whole bunch of countries. So uh, the the oldest country in Europe is actually Monaco. Uh, the, the median age is around 52. Um, if you look at America, median age is 38. Um, uh, you know, for North America, it's 35, but Mexico is young, relatively. Uh, I think that's because of all the killings in Mexico, narcos, uh, you know. Um, I, I teach surgery also in Africa, and what's amazing is that Africa's young. 
So um, a lot of change will occur in Africa in the next 50 years. Uh, what's fascinating is that hotel groups are moving down there and stuff. And I, there's war in many countries in Africa. I, uh, you know, it's, there's potential for Africa that's untapped. How that'll change in the next 50 years, I'm not sure. I'd also like to point out that um, uh, China is relatively old and uh, Japan is, of course, very old and homogeneous. And, um, de you know, when you look at demographic trends, they're interesting just because they predict future healthcare needs as a, as a country gets older, uh, disease tracks with age, and healthcare needs rise, of course. But also finances uh, change with demography. Older people don't buy as many new cars. They travel some, but not as much as younger people. So this predicts financial change as well. So there's a lot of power in demographic change. So one, one thing in America is that urologists are getting old. It's, it's a little hard to see in this slide, but about half of urologists in America are over age 50. And um, the, the uh, specialty um, with the youngest people in America is our interventional radiologists and um, nephrology and so on, it's, it's a little bit hard to see. But um, when you look at the age of urologists in America, 30% of them are over 65. Uh, most, many of these people here would already be retired or in private practice here in Greece. Uh, but if you, you take over 55, that's uh, almost 50% of American urologists. So um, if you look at the urologists that are uh, uh, targeted to retire in the next 10 to 15 years, it's in the United States, many, including myself. <laughs> but um, the, it's, what this means is, is that um, younger urologists, urologists will be quite busy. Um, so this is also happening in, in Britain, actually. Uh, the age in Britain is expected to rise from a median of 40 to 42, um, you know, um, uh, within a, I think it's a, a 10 year projection. But this is from the British Association of Urologic Surgeons. It's their, uh, their assessment of manpower needs. Uh, they expect uh, in the next 12 years for uh, 474 British urologists to retire. Uh, they think they need to expand the number of urologists because there will be a greater need for urologists by 2%. Um, the new consultants available uh, would be in the 12 year interval about 624. And so they project that there will be a shortage of urologists in, a, in, in Britain by about 150 in, in the next uh, 12 years. These are projections from 2017. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. Um, I think that uh, this is a slide, of, well, if you take urologists, how hard do they work compared to other the hardest working physicians? The answer is you may feel like you are, uh, you're not. This, in America, it's vascular surgeons and critical care doctors. Uh, but we're, we're in the upper third. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of right, right here. We're above the median. So we work harder than, for instance, occupational medicine, dermatologists, emergency room doctors that have set hours. So um, at least in America, um, we're, uh, you know, we work more than the average physician and that's what this information kind of shows. In America is expected to rise um, from 38 today to 43 by 2060. Median age in Europe is expected to go from 42 to 46 by 2080. Neurologic disease and tons of other diseases increase with aging. So one of my predictions for the future is that urologists will be very busy. There'll be a lot of patients to take care of and we will continue to work hard. In, in America, our plans to help fill the workforce gap is uh, to 
we have um, physician assistants. You don't have these in Greece. I think they should be developed. Uh, what a physician assistant is, is someone who has extensive medical training, very similar to medical school. Uh, they don't do a residency, uh, but they're, in a, they're a direct assistant. In America, they have prescriptive privileges. They can write prescriptions. I don't write any. My physician assistant writes all of them. Uh, they see patients. They can see patients independently. You know, in my practice, I see mostly the new patients and if a return patient if they have problems. Otherwise, in our system, the, phys the physician assistant see, see them. It's kind of interesting. In our place, um, if the patient's getting a regular clinic biopsy, a 12-core biopsy, that's done by a physician assistant. It's not done by a doctor. If they're getting a fusion or targeted biopsy, those are done by the doctors. But what the demographic trends show is that healthcare systems and governments are going to be greatly stressed by growing healthcare expenditures. It's already a problem in many countries. It's going to get a much, become a much, much bigger problem in the future, much bigger problem. So another area that I think is going to help, uh, and this is, tech, is artificial intelligence. So where do I think AI is going to help the most? It's two fields, radiology and pathology. So uh, in radiology, uh, already there's artificial intelligence that can predict prost prostate cancer on MRI with about a 64% accuracy. Uh, they can, um, AI can distinguish renal cell carcinoma from angiolipoma it can predict T3 uh, disease and bladder cancer on CAT scan with a close to 90% accuracy. So how would this help? If you look at radiologists in the United States, I'm not sure what the figure is here in Greece, but if at the Mayo Clinic, and this would be true at MD Anderson, um, the radiologist is looking at one image every three to four seconds. So they describe this as the gerbil wheel, like the, ra the radiologist is looking at an image every three to four seconds for eight hours a day. I would go crazy. I'm glad I'm not in radiology. I'd go berserk. Uh, but where the AI will help is that it could pre-screen the images. Then the radiologist can have a quicker look at the images and know they're not missing something that's frankly obvious. And this, I think, will help missing things. Um, you know, your radiologists, like, uh, when I look at images, I'll describe one case from my practice, but, you know, the, um, I had a patient with a neuroendocrine kidney tumor, so I'm seeing the patient in follow-up, I'm looking at the retroperitoneum, the liver and stuff, and the patient ended up having a mass in the subcutaneous tissue in the back. It ended up being benign, but that's something that artificial intelligence will see, and if you're, like when, we look, when I look at scans, I'm not looking at the entire scan. I'm looking where I think the cancer is gonna be. Uh, I, and it, this will help missed images. It, it's gonna be a big help. I don't think it's a threat to radiologists. They personally think it's a threat, uh, but I don't think it's gonna replace the radiologist. I think it's gonna help the radiologist. Another area where this will help is in pathology. Um, Already, artificial intelligence can predict Gleason score with about an 88% accuracy. It can separate low and high-grade prostate cancer with an accuracy that's in the mid-90% range. So a lot, where I teach surgery also in Africa. In Africa, many places, don't, they don't have any pathology. Uh, and um, where I, this, this could be transformative just because if you could... Um, Teach somebody to take the specimen, process it, get a microscope slide, and then use AI to give a diagnosis. It would help in areas of the world where there is no pathology. And the other place that this would help is for extremely rare diseases. Like uh, this week, Vasilis and I operated on uh, a patient with a rare tumor, and I don't think we have accurate pathology. And, maybe AI would help to improve the accuracy of pathology, especially for rare diseases that the average pathologist is not gonna see. So I think that, that artificial intelligence will help, and I don't think that it's gonna replace pathologists or radiologists. I don't think that they should feel threatened by this technology. 
what they should do is embrace it um, and use it to help them to offer better care for patients. So um, what about 5G? We hear about this a lot in America. Um, you know, I've heard that um, for internet speed, they compare it to driving down a dirt road and getting on the national highway here. Maybe not with as many toll booths, but um, well, that's yet to see. Maybe it'll be expensive. <laughs> so maybe it will have toll booths. Uh, um, where, where this technology, I think, will have a role is patients that have ongoing monitoring, like blood sugar monitoring, monitoring EKGs from home, this type of thing. Um, could it be used to, for instance, have someone take over a robotic case in some other center? The answer is yes, but there's numer barri numerous barriers to that, like you would have to get informed consent somehow. Like if you were having trouble in one center with a case and you wanted to call a consultant a couple hundred mo or a thousand or across the ocean, you would have to get consent somehow. How you do that, I don't really know. Um, my own prediction is that 5G won't be a big deal for urology, uh, but I may get that prediction wrong. And so I'd like to just conclude by uh, saying that we're practicing urology in the most advanced time in human history. That's kind of fun. It's a great thought. We have great technology like robots and much, much smaller, better ureteroscopes, much better instruments, much better cancers. We also have a gigantic armamentarium of new drugs. Uh, we're in a period of rapid change in technological advancement. Uh, Europe and America are both getting older and we're gonna face increased healthcare needs. Uh, healthcare systems and governments are gonna be stressed. Urologists will be very busy and I think artificial intelligence will help urology and, and uh, will be assistant. Uh, it, it'll assist us, not harm us. And I'd be happy to um, answer any questions or entertain any uh, discussion. Υπάρχουν ερωτήσεις ή οτιδήποτε θέλετε να συζητήσουμε. I have a question, uh, because uh, two, three years ago, in my introductory uh, talk uh, to the school, I presented uh, uh, what the big data, together with artificial intelligence, is going to change uh, uh, in uh, medicine. And uh, actually, I think that uh, uh, that will change the way that we think medically. Uh, my feeling is that uh, that will influence a lot the decision-making tree, but also it will be much easier, for example, using uh, big data to have uh, huge registries, to exchange data, uh, to have access to medical files and get uh, results and uh, conclusions from uh, uh, and also the devices, like uh, the telephone device and all this, that will affect many, many conditions because we have a huge databases to see how patients go, I mean the follow-up of these patients that we're missing now. Well, I think you're right about that. Um, you know, one of the things that is um, big discussion in America is that Google, or Alphabet is the company, has access not to our patients' data, but to patients' data within a healthcare system within the northern United States. And um, you're right that analyzing data like that will help with um, develop understanding disease better. It will, it will also help develop um, protocols and programs that I think it will assist. The other thing that's happening is the development of supercomputers. Like computing capability is, is drastically, profoundly increased. And this um, will make analyzing that type of data um, easier to do in a meaningful way. Uh, but it also has risk. Like, uh, like supercomputing will make VPN useless. 
uh, so that um, because those codes can get by a supercomputer cracked within a few minutes. So it's, it's technology that is uh, two-edged and governments are gonna have to sort of deal with it. It's, it's fascinating. We live in a very interesting world. Another thing just, uh, I mean, just uh, that's personal thoughts. I think that there will be one day because of, uh, I, I strongly believe that the robotic surgery will be the gold standard, I don't know how many years, but everywhere in the world, because we will have chip systems coming out mm -hmm. one day. And I think that uh, uh, using all those educational 3D models, which is unbelievable. I mean, I have seen lastly models that uh, nobody could recognize if it is real or not, those cases, you know, in the videos. Uh, and uh, I, I believe that uh, residents uh, will play like a gaming now, <laughs> learning how to operate all the basic skills, so they will come to residency much more mature than uh, the residents that come now in because of this... Uh... No, I think you're right that one of the things is sort of modeling surgery, and in the future, I, I, I think you're right that it would be kind of cool to have the resident um, do the operation in a model first before he works on a patient. Yeah. Like, the, uh, you know, just similar to the way that the uh, pilots spend a lot of time in a flight simulator exactly. in surgery, we don't, ha we don't do that. But I think that the, that is on the horizon. Part of it is that uh, there's a surgical simulation center in the Texas Medical Center, but to get sophisticated simulation is very, of the human body is, is difficult. And it's also very expensive, so that um, what is known now is that you know cheap simulators like a cardboard box and you try your laparoscopy, right now it seems to be as efficient as the high fidelity simulation. But as time goes on, that may change just because um, you know with um, faster computing and so on, maybe we could simulate blood flow and this type of thing. It's, it's, it's gonna be, simulation will get uh, almost certainly better, and also, as you point out, cheaper robotics will come. So a lot will happen in the future that will impact resident training. Uh, do, do you think that there's going to be any problem uh, regarding the finances of the system and is, if there's going to be any danger about creating new problems in accessing the new technologies and uh, new drugs, et cetera, et cetera, in the future. Because right now we are seeing this phenomenon worldwide in the States. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, um, I think that I, What's hard is that new treatments generally are always more expensive. And it's, it's not, eventually that kind of um, problem becomes unsustainable. It will be unsustainable. So I, um, I, I don't really, uh, you know, I think that the governments are gonna struggle with it. They're already struggling with it. In America, they struggle with it too. Uh, just because we can't necessarily treat everybody with every treatment. The, there's just not an ability to do that. Uh, but um, I don't have a perfect answer for that. It's something that is going to be a bigger and bigger problem. Uh, part of this is that when you look at the cost of new drugs, for instance, I have my own ideas of what should be done. Um, you, and other people would have other ideas. Uh, but um, I personally believe that you don't want the pharmaceutical companies not to develop things. So there needs to be some profit, but the profit shouldn't be off the charts obscene. And my own thought is to give them a longer patent on the drug in return for a re much reduced price. But that's my idea, and I, I, I would be happy to listen to other ideas. It's, it, it's gonna be really hard in the future. I, I remember 20 years ago, 
I don't, uh, yeah, I think that the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine had published a letter, you know, saying that uh, one of solution could be that uh, uh, the pharma industry to keep the patent and uh, every, you know, 10 years, whatever, to reduce the price by 50%, 60, you know, but to keep the patent for, uh, for 30 or 40 years. So mm -hmm. this is something that has been proposed the, 20 years ago. Well, I think it would help the drug companies because what you don't want is to sort of uh, get a, a, a rock star drug, get all this money, and then, um, then it, the drug goes off patent and then you have no income and you're hoping to get another drug. It would be better to have steady, small income over a long time and then you could do research and find the next drug. Like, that, that's, um, you know, what's kind of crazy to me also about the pharmaceutical industry is that you would think when there's competitor drugs that the price would go down and that often doesn't seem to happen. I don't really understand that. So it's not totally a free market. Just to give information to the audience that in the United States, uh, when uh, a drug loses the patent, the company stops really producing this drug the same day. It's not like here that we have both the prototype and the generics in the market. It's not like that in the United States. Yerasmus. What is, the, what is the big advantage to your patients uh, when you consult them about uh, surgical treatment of uh, prostate cancer uh, in offering the procedure robotically compared to open? What is your big uh, issue there? How do you convince your patients uh, that they have to do it robotically and not openly from medical point of view? Well, part of that, <laughs> I, I think that that's uh, unfortunately true, is that in America, about 90% of the surgery is robotic, maybe 92. So our residents have never even seen an open prostatectomy. And, um, you know, so when I talk to patients, I just, um, I tell them that, as opposed to saying which is better, open or robotic, I think a smarter question is to ask the doctor, in your own hands, do you think you can do a better operation on me with the robot or without the robot? And I think that's a much better question, actually. In my own hands, I can do a better operation with the robot, but for someone else, they could maybe do a better operation with their own hands. Please. What's your opinion about adopting the novel technologies? I'm not speaking about the robot right now, but there are a series of novel technologies uh, that have been adopted or want to be adopted without the, the proper uh, check out of their fidelity, etc. Yeah. Um, uh, regarding BPH, we have a lot of examples. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yes. It's, I, as a... spend money very, very easy. It's, it's kind of crazy, yeah. I think part of your, what you're getting at is when new technology comes out, um, how do we make sure we're safe in the implementation of it and how can we show that it actually has true benefit for the patient, which is also critical. The way that works in our own hospital, and I don't have an answer for system-wide, but in our own hospital, uh, we have a committee that looks at new technology. And um, the committee sort of helps, sort of, they will al allow new technology, but they'll also monitor it so that if the new technology is not beneficial, we um, stop using it. So we actually have a committee within our hospital that vets new technology decides if it's reasonable to try the new technology. And then if we try it, they reassess whether or not it's, is it worth going for, or is it, is it do you wanna leave it on the side? But that's a single hospital, it's not a, a system. Um, I think the system needs to 
sort of evaluate and do the same process, though. Well, just uh, uh, I'm going to offer you something, uh, a copy from the Archaeological Museum of Thessaloniki showing Asclepios and Hygieia. So oh, just, thank you. just remember our visit to Euroschool. The box is outside, so I brought it. So sure, this is Asclepios and Hygieia together, and it's from the Archaeological Museum of Thessaloniki. Well, thank you very, very much. <laughs> just thank uh, you. to thank you and to remember, yes. to remind you of uh, your visit to Euroschool.